Alice Gretchen. Am I saying it right? G-R-E-C-H-Y-H something something. <laughs> what kind of name is Gretchen? Is that like a, do you have to spell it for everybody or what? I do. Uh, yes, it is pronounced Gretchen, just like the girl's first name. It's G-R-E-C-Z-Y-N and it's Polish in origin. And usually if I say the CZ, you just think Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic now. Um, usually people will get it a little bit more then. But How yeah. do I introduce you? Is it, uh, I know it's author, but also what, actress, model? kind of thing or what? Yeah, oh, so I'm, my career identity is in flux at the moment. So right now we'll just go with um, uh, actress, author, and founder of Dare to Doubt is pretty much what I've been, that's like what's in the bios, but. All right. You, <laughs> you know, I, your book, I, I'm sent a lot of books and I appreciate it. You know, everybody's telling their stories and I, I encourage that. I think one of the ways that we change minds and change the culture is to share stories. But I found your book really compelling because of what you came out of, which is mm. fundy Christianity, but very much a shame culture. And the book deals a lot with that. So start me at the very beginning. I'm not going to make this the book, but for those who are just now being introduced, what does that look like? What did you come out of? So I came out of non-denominational Christianity with a particular slant leaning towards um, charismatic uh, vineyard movement brand. Um, today the media would have called us evangelical, but when I was growing up, evangelical was its own denomination that we were not a part of, so it was confusing. But in my teen years, um, my parents became less involved with churches in the charismatic community and more involved with more, um, I guess, again, using the word evangelical now, uh, just a, a, a little more mild version of that. It was heavily focused on spiritual warfare still and sexual purity. And that's where the, um, for me as a teenager especially, that's where the shame uh, really left some scars. Uh, and it was very, and I also shamed. Um, that was part of the, the holding each other accountable uh, in love, of course. And um, yeah, there's, there's a lot a lot to unpack there that I'm still unpacking in my present life. Interesting <laughs> how that specific flavor of purity culture, even when it includes the male, really is female focused, right? I would agree with that. I think ultimately girls and women um, are taught to be the gatekeepers. We're, told, we're taught to expect an onslaught of male attention at all times. And we we're also taught that the men and boys aren't necessarily capable of helping themselves. Um, and so it was our job, our duty as sisters in Christ to help them with that by dressing modestly, by not, um, not laughing too hard at their jokes and not, not, not uh, doing anything that could be deemed flirtatious. And uh, it was, it's, it's tricky because anything could be deemed flirtatious. Yeah, it's hugely subjective. Yes, yes. Right. it is. Um, but yeah, I think in that sense, boys and men were definitely uh, held accountable for what they chose to do with their lust, like don't watch porn, don't jerk off, treat girls like uh, sisters. But ultimately it was on the girls to um, dress in a way that would help facilitate that. And if we didn't, and if a boy lusted over us or stumbled over us anyway, the whole what was she wearing, you know, or oh, we know it was her. We we saw her hanging out with the guys. She only hangs out with the guys. She loves male attention. Like there, there is still a lot of blame. I feel like um, inappropriately directed at the at the female involved. Yeah, I mean the, the subtext of, or sometimes just the text of that is she was totally asking for it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. How could she have not known? Yeah. Um, and we're talking, you know, I'm I'm talking anyway about teenage girls and a lot of us very sheltered. I was homeschooled my entire life until I went to college. And so I was not used to seeing kids my own age interact really. Plus my family moved around a lot. So I, I never really got to stay in one church group for very long either. So I was extremely naive to how every little thing I did could and would be perceived as flirting. Um, I couldn't help that a lot of girls didn't like me at first or would not warm up to me. And so by default, a lot of my friends did happen to be guys. And that was seen as um, a deliberate choice on my end. And I was completely oblivious to it. And it's not what I wanted per se, but- And I even if it was a choice, I mean, it's your choice. So what? Really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How tight was this pod? I mean, was it homeschool? What are we talking about here? So, man, if 
My family started traveling when I was 13, and so from the ages of 13 up until 15, I went to many different youth groups. Um, and so they all had their own different flavor and verses that they like to focus on in regards to purity culture and uh, guy-girl behavior and things like that. Um, I would say that the most intense one was the last one that I was a part of, which was in Colorado. Uh, I was 15, I just turned 15 when my family moved there. And um, there were a couple of kids in the youth group who dated, but I don't recall ever seeing them do anything more than hold hands. Uh, and there were only, they were a little more fringe, as were a couple other people who were more like me who were super, super strict, like purity ring, no dating, I kiss dating goodbye, the courtship, you know, pr uh, praying for my future husband all the time. True love um, waits. True love waits, that, that whole movement, When God Writes Your Love Story by, by the Ludies. Um, I was very much in that camp because I viewed viewed it as close to a modern literalist interpretation of the Bible um, that suited the integrity that I felt I needed to live out in my faith. Um, I, by nature, was just a very literal kid, and there were definitely verses that I did not take literally that I was like, oh, that's for that time and place. But uh, I cherry-picked as, just as much as anyone else. Um, but even with my cherry-picking, I was still just a much more fundamentalist, literal-leaning uh, adolescent. So I made it harder on myself in many ways, but the church and the teachings and ultimately the Bible affirmed that I was right. I would get praised for that. Um, so it, even though I objectively now can look back and be like, wow, I was such a little stuck up goody two shoes. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I was actually the truest Christian that I knew how to be. Well, I mean, a lot of those cultures are built that way, right? Affirm, make you feel special, validate yeah. you. I mean, that oh, feels yeah. pretty damn good, right? So the uh, seeds of doubt start when? I mean, obviously you bust it out, but what's that even look like? Without reading the book to me, what's that look like? So what that looked like for me, I had had, there, there'd been moments of doubt ever since I was a little kid, um, mainly, mainly when I was confronted with human suffering. It was like, wait, God's all powerful and loves us, but lets this happen? and then doesn't tell us why we're supposed to just trust. That always troubled me since I was really little and I heard about a toddler who, who suffocated to death in a dry cleaning bag. Um, very disturbed by that, so that haunted me. But when I was 17 years old, um, you, like I said, I was a very uh, purity wearing, future husband praying for type of uh, true love waits girl. and. The trade-off for all of my fidelity to my future spouse that I believed God wanted of me was that God was going to bless me with this amazing love story that was going to be beyond anything I could imagine. And I was just a hopeless romantic. And so I had a big imagination and I thought, man, like it's going to be amazing, this, this love story God has for me, because it's supposed to exceed my own expectations. Um, turned out uh, a guy who I was good friends with um, just one day out of the blue told me that God had shown him I was his future wife. And I didn't feel anything romantic for him. And, uh, but I believed him. Now, like, if I can jump in, yeah. this sounds like a pickup line. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, I am your destiny sounds like a setup. Do you get the vibe he was legit and sincere? I mean, I know you can't totally know for sure, yeah. but. I knew him pretty well um, and I do think he was sincere, as sincere as the other people in my, li in my life who said that they believed God led them to do X, Y, Z. He, he knew uh, the, the devotion of my, of my purity, of my fidelity, of my intention. Um, we'd known each other for a couple years and had gone to the same youth group together. So he very much, it I don't think it was so much a pickup line as much as he probably had a crush on me and figured, those feelings must be from God. Sure, the spirit is moving yeah. within me and affirming this. Yes, and because like I was, you know, such a, a righteous woman, and he was a very, you know, righteous guy. I think, um, I think he could rule out that it wasn't a tempting of the flesh that he could get like an easy kiss or a lay out of me. It was very. He wasn't going to kiss me until our wedding day. Um, that's that was on the on the table. And so, um, furthermore, it wasn't just him saying that. Uh, my father and his mother also affirmed that they'd that God had shown them that 
Luke is his name in, in the book, that Luke and I were gonna get married. And so there was all this external validation from spiritual elders. And in that culture, purity culture, that's what you lean on to make sure that you're not acting on your own fleshly will and desire. So it was not only this guy who said this to me, but it was affirmed by our spiritual elders. And for me, particularly by my father, uh, in biblical terms, like the patriarch of our family, and you know, I belonged to my father until I belonged to my husband. Um, my dad wasn't really like that, but that was that was what I grew up in. I didn't really question it at the time. I had no reason to. So um, it all just unfolded how it did, and we were betrothed for two months. And that whole time, I really wrestled with. Um, my honest feelings were of utter devastation, betrayal, anger, and just deep depression, but I could not let myself even acknowledge really that I felt that way because to acknowledge that would mean that I was disappointed in God and that I was angry with God. Now, to be clear, you were feeling these things because you had no attraction yeah. to Luke. Yeah, it, I just felt like I'd bought in, I'd done my part of um, the purity culture promise that if I did X, God would do Y, and I'd done X. I had been so so pure and so faithful and devoted, and then it was like God, how I rationalized it in my mind at the time was like, oh, of course God would give me someone that I'm not attracted to that way because attraction is shallow, and I need to care more about his character, and he's a godly young man, and that's what matters more. It doesn't matter that I don't have lust for him. I'm, maybe I'm not supposed to until our wedding day. And then maybe, I, there were so many ways I tried to rationalize God's betrayal. The love will come someday. That the was probably part of it, right? <laughs> and also, I, the other way that I rationalized it was where in the Bible did a woman marry for love? She married out of necessity and she married because she was traded or bought. There were arranged marriages all the time in the Bible, and it felt to me like I was in an, an arranged betrothal, not in the sense that our parents got together and decided like, this is gonna happen, but in the sense that this was a biblically led romance and God gave a f affirmation to these three people and I needed to act on faith to do it or else risk disobeying God, leaving the umbrella of God's safety and exposing myself to the devil and all of the destruction he wanted to do to me. So um, ultimately, I broke off my betrothal, which I would not have done had my mother not uh, really encouraged me to do so, because she could tell I was deeply unhappy, and she also, like myself, had not heard from God that I was supposed to marry this guy. Um, but it was still the scariest thing I'd ever done. I thought mom was being used by Satan to like deter me from what otherwise looked to be God's very clear will. Um, and that, in retrospect, I can say was the beginning of my uh, questioning uh, my period of doubt and uh, what some people today might call deconstruction. I was still a Christian for almost four years after that, but I was the more progressive kind where I decided like, no, I'm gonna have sex and I think God's gonna still love me and I don't think my gay friends are going to hell and I don't think I even need to go to church anymore. So there's I- There's a was, shit ton of that going on in the culture today, right? There is, there is. And it both, um, I both applaud it and I'm confused by it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, might as well make Christianity a better place as long as it's one of the world's top religions. But I'm also like, is it Christianity? I don't, I don't know, who's to say what real Christianity is? Don't wanna go there, but where I settled to for myself, um, eventually I gave God a test and uh, I just couldn't doubt anymore. I couldn't keep waffling back and forth of like, is there a God, is there not a God? And he failed. And I read about it in the book. Um, so if anyone's curious how that, how that went, uh, you can read it there, but. I'll put the link in the description box. You know, it's interesting too, um, a lot of people heard what you just said about a betrothal and their mouth drops open and they go, what century is this? Like this doesn't happen today, or at least not in mainstream Christian circles today. Mm. And you would beg to differ. Yes, I would say, you know, well, first of all, we need to define what is mainstream um, because admittedly, maybe the types of Christian groups I was a part of could be more fringe, but they were all I knew. So to me, they were 
they were my whole world. I had nothing to compare them to, and other Christians weren't true Christians. So That's probably a good point. It's probably more fundamental where we're seeing this more casual, cultural, mainstream Christianity branch off. So yeah. maybe that's a better way to say it, yeah. Yeah, but e either way, like I do think it is far more common in, in the Western world, in the United States specifically. Um, I think it's a lot more common than a lot of people are aware of or would be willing to admit. Um, there's... Uh, even been reports, and I've I've looked up these. A lot of them have been taken down from their source sites. But um, fairs, like fundamentalist Christian homeschool fairs, where parents will get together and do like an old-fashioned arranged marriage of their kids who are still kids, like still underage, um, and they'll they'll arrange these marriages. And sometimes the kids will get married under 18. Sometimes they wait until the kids are over 18. Um, there's a, such an emphasis often in these groups to be fruitful and multiply. And so the younger a girl can start having children and doing that, um, the more fruitful she can potentially be throughout her fertile years. And um, that's just all kinds of fucked up for all kinds of reasons. That sounds a little quiverful, doesn't it? It's, it, really it's very quiverful. Well, yes. you know, there's another Bible verse that talks about it's better for you to marry than to burn with lust, right? Yes. So obviously puberty kicks in, natural attractions occur. And if the median age for marriage in this country is 30, that's freaking, you know, almost two full decades yeah. of wrestling with normal, natural desire and inclinations, right? And I do think that um, there's something to be said for when puberty kicks in and we are burning with lust. Like, I do think that there should be um, safe, consensual ways for developing young adults to, to explore that and explore themselves. Um, from an informed, again, consensual place. But marriage, legally binding contracts that may or may not be what these young people want and oftentimes isn't, that is something um, that I have no qualms about saying I don't, I think should be very uh, deferred and kept illegal <laughs> in as many states as possible. Um, but I do think that, you know, to be, to be fair, I can also see an argument for, you know, back, back in biblical days, um, why burn with lust when you can just marry? So I understand why people might marry younger if that really is what you believe, that it's sinful to um, explore your sexuality outside of the marriage bed, then of course you're gonna marry, encourage younger marriage. And our society today um, doesn't, it's not conducive to that. I, f I feel like, especially here in the States, we still have abstinence-only teachings and marriage is still uh, delayed in most places until 18 without parental consent. And so we have this in-between period of a few really hormonally intense years where kids naturally have the urge to explore themselves and their sexuality um, and are being horribly underinformed with how to do so in safe, um, consensual ways. So I think if our culture could just be a, a lot less puritanical about it and a lot more pragmatic about nature and biology and timing, mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be better for everyone. We wouldn't have to resort to marriage. <laughs> well, I think too, you know, it's interesting to watch the repression culture because the Bible Belt states are leading the country in teen pregnancy, right? For lack of mm -hmm. sex education. Mm -hmm. And we have this big problem with STDs because of lack of sex education. We see porn use is the most prevalent in these highly religious states like Utah, which is, you know, it's a repression culture. You know, I, I heard it said once that if the church can control your sexuality, they've got all of you. You know, yes. it, it speaks to identity, it speaks to who you spend your life with, it speaks to your value system. Like if they've got you in the bedroom, they've got you everywhere, right? Yes, yes, and it, you know, I, I can't remember who said it first, because, and it's certainly not original, but um, most humans, with the exception maybe of people who identify as asexual, have a sense of sexuality and have a sex drive. And so it keeps us in that shame cycle of needing redemption. When we criminalize sexual activity and sexual desire and we offer a place for repentance for it, then it keeps people in that cycle and it keeps them in church even if they don't marry and, and have kids. It, like It's a very personal thing that one might wrestle with. Um, that, yeah, again, kind of touches back on that, that shame thing. Well, it's something you focus on so much in the book that I felt like it was something we should cover here. I mean, this is obviously, yeah. a, it's a big deal. It's probably one of the big 
uh, types of feedback that you get from people who discover your work because you speak mm. so much to shame culture. You hear mm. from a, a lot of these people who were raised like you were raised and are maybe just now starting to ask the questions and navigate, yes, no? Yes, yes, and one of the one of the more common questions I get is how do you free yourself from sexual shame? Like how do you, how do you heal the baggage that purity culture can often leave you with? And that's a, that's a tricky question because I think um, I, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a sexuality expert, and so all I can share is my experience and um, common threads in the anecdotal experiences of the people that I've talked with, but I think it's a very individual journey. Uh, for me, um, I, my career, which started off in modeling, led me to being in front of the camera in scantily clad, we might say, and in that I found a lot of healing and empowerment by letting, per permitting myself to just be um, an embodied sensual woman in places that I felt safe to be so. Um, that was very healing for me, but a lot of people might be like, oh no, I would feel exploited and exposed, like that would be harmful for me. So I think it's a very individual journey to how one finds healing for their shame, um, specifically sexual shame. We all have different experiences, um, so I think we're all gonna have different paths uh, to healing from it. But yeah, and one of the other things that I, that I get told a lot too, because especially in the past year or so, I've also been speaking up about shame that I see in the secular culture and the nerves that it, the buttons that it pushes for me and a lot of other um, ex, uh, ex believers. Uh, we see a, a ten, an increasing tendency for um, publicly holding people accountable for moral offenses. I'm not, I'm not talking about crimes that are actually against the law. I'm talking about perceived instances of sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, things like that. Um, sometimes people might just be ignorant and asking a sincere question and they get brandished for being part of the problem if they don't already know. And I have uh, a lot of bones to pick with this particular type of public shaming, which some people might call um, cancel culture. And I'm trying to be better about steering clear of certain verbiage that can be just instantly triggering. But uh, to be frank, that is what I'm talking about. And I think um, there's been a lot of uh, people that I've connected with who used to be believers who feel triggered the same way. It's like, oh, whoa, once again, we're holding each other accountable, calling it love, and it feels the same. It feels like a public brandishment. Um, it feels like a bombardment. My job is now at stake. My family, my, my kids are now, you know, getting made fun of in school. Um, and so I think that uh, it's been a very interesting thing for me, both as a former evangelical Christian and as a, um, political centrist <laughs> to see these two flavors of shame slash accountability coming up. And in the ex-believer space, it does tend to swing a lot more left when people free themselves from the obligation that they feel they have to be a, a conservative and a little more right-leaning. I think it's a very natural and um, oftentimes very healthy swing to make. Uh, but the danger with going too far sometimes is that um, I know, speaking for myself, there's a risk of overcompensating that can then blind me to repeating the same patterns at the opposite end of the spectrum, if that makes sense. Yeah, I recently wrote in an article for Only Sky that I oppose extremism on the left for the same reason that I oppose it on the right. Yes. Right? Which is something I'd heard Dr. Hector Garcia say. And, and uh, you know, I think all tribes can be dogmatic. They can be binary thinkers. We tend to have a blind spot. So we could never be wrong. And they are the other, they're horrible people. They're not just wrong, but they're evil. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know, I was a Fox News watching Christian nationalist, anti-choice, anti-everything, you know, I was that guy. I wasn't evil. I was just wrong, you know? I, I mean, I needed to be rescued from some very bad ideas. And I, you know, I, I think this uh, desire we have to other people to the extent where they can't be reached or reasoned with, or we can never be wrong, probably is, this, that speaks to kind of what you're going for, right? When I hear you speak now, this sort of dogmatic binary model for us versus them, right? 
That's what it, that's what I observe. Yes, um, I wouldn't disagree with anything you just said in summarizing that. Uh, it it to me, I've been learning. So I read a, a really helpful book. Um, by a linguistics professor named John McWhorter. Uh, he's a black American and his book is titled Woke Racism. Uh, and this, I, I don't wanna misquote his subtitle, but it's, his book is basically how uh, he likens wokeism to another religion in the sense that there's um, these, sorry, these topics feel so contentious that I've, I've developed a lot of anxiety about even well, I, I'm already anticipating in the comments section. I will just say that we're just Shouldn't talking. Go here. Like okay. we're just talking, and okay. and you know, I think I'd like to clarify because we've talked about this on the show. Mm -hmm. A lot of people like to dismiss issues of social justice by calling it woke, and they just wipe mm -hmm. it off the table. Mm -hmm. And so I think the word's been weaponized in a lot of ways. But I also understand what is meant when someone says you are so woke that you've just lost the plot. You're way off left field. You have, you're an extremist to the point where you are harming the causes you mm. ostensibly promote. And I think that's probably how I'm receiving woke whenever I hear you say it. No, yeah. yes. Yeah, so the term that I've been um, practicing as a substitute for woke for those reasons you just named to try to make it a little less derogatory or weaponized, um, far left. I, I would identify as left, like I'm very pro-choice, I'm very LGBTQ affirming, uh, but there are people who are more left than me, let's just say, who, would, who um, are, we do share some things in common, but they take on a role of being a peer policeman in the sense that they feel obliged and desiring, apparently, to um, publicly bully people in the name of love. I have a very difficult time seeing public brandishment uh, as loving. I, I feel like if someone is truly personally offended or has more questions about something, I don't understand why it can't be dialogued about in private. And again, not talking about crimes here, not talking about large scale things, um, but just for the record, like there's a, I don't know, I, I feel like it's, it is harmful when it becomes based in an ideological belief and conviction rather than an individual and the unique circumstances around it. Um, all Republicans are Nazis. Yes. <laughs> or fascist or all, all, all anything. What's that line? All generalizations are false, right? That clever line. Oh, I don't know that line. Uh, I just, I've heard somebody <laughs> through that. Yeah, through that and I think, I think really what I, what I, um, the other word maybe that we're, that is around this area is nuance. I feel like, uh, you know, nuance is very vilified because it's looked at as um, cherry picking. Yeah, or equivocation, right? I mean, really? why are you going soft on the enemy, on these enemies of, of goodness? Kind of yes, and I, and I hold, I think that there's a place for that. I, I feel like there's also a place for nuance and we need to make it safe for people to ask questions and maybe actually want to be educated instead of just hurling at them, like educate yourself, read a book, like have you ever lear learned history? I feel like when we approach ignorance and um, inquis inquisitivity like that, we really risk alienating people. And I know for me, it pushes my buttons of when I was a Christian, uh, it aff that kind of backlash affirmed that, oh, I'm being persecuted, that means I'm right even more. Um, it didn't necessarily make me double down, it just made me give up and double down inside. So I feel like uh, I can only bring my, my le the lens of my own experience to a lot of the other um, issues that we face today, but I feel like mine is just as valid as another one's. Um, and I think I hope that um, as we hopefully balance out a little bit more as a society, we can get to a place where nuance feels safer and where genuine curiosity can be met with genuine um, compassion instead of ignorance just being whipped all over the internet with yeah, if I was unkindness. doubting but still sort of married to some bad ideas, I'm so glad I didn't go on Twitter and oh, start asking questions, right? Because I would have been destroyed. It wouldn't have been just tribes, it would have been mobs. Yeah. And I think that's what I lament the most. Yeah. And this idea that talking through things and trying to find understanding to defeat ignorance and also, you know, acknowledging that we might be able to be wrong about something. You know, some people yeah. see that as a weakness. 
Um, that's tough in the Twitterverse. It's, it's tough at 280 characters. Mm -hmm. I find a little more utility when the face-to-face. -face. I don't know about you, but you know, when, oh, yes. it's, when it's not just an avatar or an email or a tweet, but when it's people. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I th yeah. <laughs> so um, what are you blogging about and how do people find you? I know you're writing articles these days for your website, but what's your focus today? So my focus today, I'm, I'm actually wanting to dabble more in the video sphere. So I'm, I'm, I've been taking a break from writing to focus on some other projects. Um, none of them are quite ready to, to be discussed just yet, but... Uh, Would you call yourself a product of Hollywood, you know, having been in films and, I mean, are you still a California girl and all that stuff, or uh, what? I feel like I'll always be a California girl. Uh, I was born in California, and even though I spent my childhood living in many other places, I've lived in LA for 19 years now. Very much feels like home. Um, with acting, I took a break from acting and formally left my representation so I could finish my book. And then once my book came out, that we were in the beginning still or middle of a pandemic and uh, it's been hard to get back into acting. Do you I'm, worry a little bit, if I can jump in, do you worry about some people? I don't know if Hollywood really cares about apostates and these religious stories, but does that put you on some kind of blacklist somewhere or do you worry about that? I definitely worry about it. I'm not sure if it actually does put me on a potential blacklist. Um, I think that Hollywood is very supportive of people disavowing evangelical Christianity. I don't think Hollywood generally is as warm or welcoming to outright atheists. Um, my experience in Hollywood is that a lot of the people there are very spiritual, um, very into like more new agey astrology, crystals, tarot, psychics, um, very spiritual. And so I think because I'm an outspoken atheist who is just as critical of spirituality as I am of uh, formally recognized religion, um, that might turn more people off to me than if I was just criticizing Christianity per se. Uh, I don't feel any more warmly toward the Eastern religions uh, than I do towards the ones that have sprung in the West. So um, I'm not sure ultimately how that may or may not have impacted my acting career. I do know there's other atheist actors in Hollywood, but most of them don't wear it on their sleeve, um, it, which is understandable to me because when you have roughly 70% of the country who identifies as Christian, producers aren't going to want to hire an openly out atheist because they might alienate a majority of the fan base that's so it's uh, the gonna film cost business. Money. Yeah. Exactly. It's a business. And so why cast someone who's openly atheist? Well, you know, um, in, in uh, I guess you could always call the folks at Pure Flix and you know, you could do God's Not Dead 8 yeah. or whatever <laughs> those are. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, how do people find you and your work? Give me the uh, the page, the site, the account. Where do they go? So I, the social media platform that I'm most active on is Instagram, and people can find me at Alice Gretchen, just my name, um, and then alicegretchen.com. And lately I've been writing more um, short stories about my time in Hollywood, actually. That's been a writing project that I've, been, that I've been having a lot of fun with. It's less like my other articles and blogs in the sense that it's really more of a creative indulgence, but a lot of people seem to be enjoying them. Um, and in them, you know, it's more Hollywood-focused uh, about my, my escapades as, a, as an actress and young model in the early aughts, but um, my past and my, my Christian past specifically can't help but show up sometimes. Um, the last one that I wrote about was when I was trying to plug into a church in Hollywood and what I really thought of LA Christians, and it was not nice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, like people, people uh, can follow along there. Those are just called Alice in Hollywood Land. Um, so you can search by the hashtag or just follow me on Instagram. And I'm glad you busted out. I'm glad you Thank made you. it, right? I mean, it's a long ass journey and it's, you know, there's a lot of baggage there. And I think there's some therapy in trying to encourage others, you know, maybe there's mm. some other Alice Gretchen out there who is going through what you went through. I hear from them all the time, guys and girls, a lot of girls, but it is, it is the most rewarding part of publishing my book and doing anything else that I do is getting to hear from other people like, wow, thank you for articulating my story because it helped bring me a lot of clarity and uh, comfort. And so that's, that's why I share anything that I publicly share. And so messages like that are um, incredibly meaningful to me and are, motivate me to keep doing what I do. Alice Gretchen, thanks so much for talking to me. Thank you, Seth. <laughs>